Let's start with a word of prayer. I don't know that I can have enough room to bow down in here, so I'm just going to stand this time. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for another opportunity to enter into your word. And once again, I Lord, I ask that you would, um, that you would bless this meeting, that you would be in control. And Lord, we lift up those who have recently lost their children in this horrific shooting down in uh, Florida and ask that you, uh, that you be with the families and that, Lord, uh, and somehow, in some way, that this could be used to um, illustrate the, the situation that we are in as a people, as a nation, and as a world, and that um, it would do a work to hasten your soon coming. We pray this in your blessed Son's name. Amen. Okay, we're going to lay down a few principles uh, before we get into this. And what we're going to do is turn with me to um, Amos, the book of Amos. And we're going to go to Amos chapter 3, and we're going to read one of Bill's favorite quotes. Amos chapter 3. And uh, we're going to just read part of the quote. We're going to look at verse 7. Friends, this is the word of God, and we can take it to the bank. Amen? Amen. In Amos chapter 3 and verse 7, it says this, Surely the Lord God will do nothing. Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. So friends, when we look at uh, the course of human history, and we get down to about the year 1798, and I'm just picking that out of the air, but there's a reason why. At about that time, cataclysmic and drastic changes start occurring in our world. Do you realize this? I mean, in the 1700s, in the late 1700s, technology explodes on the scene. You know, we're talking about uh, in, in, in anatomy, in, uh, uh, in, uh, in science, in, uh, in math and uh, in inventions, in, in the steam uh, engine, and, and various other things like this, just explode onto the scene, and we enter into what's known as the Industrial Revolution. And that series of events changes all of our lives. And so the things that we have in this place uh, right now, heat, central heat, uh, electricity, lighting, all these things, uh, e e even, even the textiles and the furniture and all these kind of things, are part of that revolution. It would be a completely different world without those events. And so, in the course of human history, would God allow events to change like that so fast to, into the modern world, which brings with it a whole different group of temptations, of lifestyles, of pitfalls, without sending a prophet to give us warning on how to live? Verse 8, the lion hath roared, who will not fear? The Lord hath spoken, who can but prophesy? So friends, let's just ask the question, would God bring us to the time of the end and not reestablish the gift of prophecy to his people, yes or no? Turn with me to the book of Joel. The book of Joel. Oh, excuse, you know what, let's, for time's sake... Because we don't have to be redundant. Let's get, just go right to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 2. And, uh, and we're going to quote Joel in Acts. How's that? Get, we'll get both of them with one quote here. Okay? Uh, Acts chapter 2 and uh, verse 16. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God... I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens, I will pour out, my, pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall what? 
prophesy. So the Bible uh, promises us that in the last days that God is going to pour out his gift of the spirit of prophecy. Amen? Amen. Now let's turn quickly to the book of Revelation. Revelation, Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. And by the way, before we get to chapter 12, how about chapter 10, verse 11? Revelation chapter 10 and verse 11. And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. Amen? Amen. Now Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. Notice this. Now we're getting zeroed in on who it is or what group of people it is that's going to have the gift of prophecy. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 17, the Bible says, And the dragon, who's that? Satan. Was wroth with the woman, that's the church, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. So here we have this people, and Satan is really wanting to get them. He hates them. And they have what? They have the testimony of Jesus and they have the what? Commandments of God. They keep the commandments of God, right? So that's important. You know, I was reading a quote last night from Mrs. White, and she says, uh, she was talking about this man, and he was preaching the Sabbath and some of our other teachings, right? And she goes, he is no different than the Seventh-day Baptist, because he may have an understanding of the Sabbath, and he may be... Uh, endorsing the commandments of God, but you know what he doesn't have? The testimony of Jesus. Which is? The spirit of prophecy. Let's go to the book of <coughs> Revelation 19 and verse 10. Notice what it says here. The Bible is going to tell us what the testimony of Jesus is. And I fell at his feet to worship him, and he said unto me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus... Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So, brothers and sisters, I want to just lay this thing down here because this is important. The spirit of prophecy is the testimony of who? Jesus. Jesus. So, that means that God, through Jesus, is communicating to his prophets what? His will and his word. Yeah. Amen? Amen? So, if we have a testimony that's brought to us by his prophets, and we reject it, we are rejecting who? Jesus. Jesus. Jesus, friends, you're not rejecting the prophet, you're rejecting Christ. Okay? This is very important here. Because Mrs. White says that the last deception... Friends, listen, how many are after the last? None. The last deception of Satan for God's people is to make none effect the testimonies. Okay, let me just say this. Are they doing away with the testimonies? Well, no, they're not. They're making them of none effect. It's like the Constitution of the United States. Mrs. White says it's going to be made of none effect. They're not going to get rid of the Constitution, but they're going to, in principle, get rid of it by making it of no effect. Right? Every principle, every principle of the Constitution we'd be done away with, but not the Constitution itself. And what I'm submitting to you is this. People are quoting Mrs. White. In fact, I know ministers that don't believe that Ellen White's a prophet and they quote her. Sure. <laughs> That's true. That's true. I know ministers, Seventh-day Adventist ministers, that have told me in private they do not believe Ellen White's a prophet and they quote her. Okay? But what they're doing is, when you pick and choose which one of the testimonies that you will agree with and won't, you won't agree with, you're actually making it of none effect. And I have this book right here. What's this book? I love this book. Can I show you? How many people love this book? This is, my, this is my workbook here. I mean, this is right here. This is the most important book in our lives. And friends, this is the second most important. Right here. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to turn to the spirit of prophecy right here. And 
and this is God's gift to his people, and we're identified. Friend, isn't it exciting that we are actually, by using this book right here, by using this book, we're being identified as fellow servants. Amen? Amen. Because we have the testimony of Jesus right here. And I'm going to bring up a quote right here because it's some principles, and I've used this quote again and again and again, and we're going to have to use it again here because there's something really important here that we have to go over. And it's a principle of how to study the Bible. I'm sorry. Hold on a second. Let me find the right page. Hmm. Bear with me. Okay. Here we are. We're on page 320 to 321 in the Great Controversy. And um, I, hate to, I hate to read so much, but I think it's really important, especially for those of us that may not be uh, familiar with this quote right here. What's that? Uh, this is in the chapter, American Reformer, okay? And this is what she says. Now listen, Mrs. White is actually quoting William Miller here. And it, well, actually, she's quoting a book uh, by a guy named Sylvester Bliss, mm -hmm. who wrote a book, Memoirs of William Miller. And, and friends, listen, when the prophet is quoting another person, she's endorsing that person, amen? Yep. Okay? So listen to this. This is talking about William Miller. And this is, in order for us to agree on prophecy, we have to agree on the methodology. N notice this. Endeavoring to lay aside all preconceived opinions. That's amazing, isn't it? Because there's all kinds of opinions. This is what Miller did. And dispensing with commentaries. He compared scripture with scripture by the aid of the marginal reference and the concordance. That's what he did. I'm going to let the Bible interpret itself. Compare scripture with scripture. He pursued his study in a regular and methodical manner. Beginning with Genesis and reading verse by verse, he proceeded no faster than the meaning of the several passages so unfolded as to leave him free from all embarrassment. When he found anything obscure, it was his custom to compare it with every other text which seemed to have any reference to the matter under consideration. Every word was permitted to have its proper bearing upon the subject of the text. And if, and if, the view, and if his view of it harmonized with every collateral passage, it ceased to be a difficulty. Thus, whenever he met with a passage hard to be understood, he found the explanation in some other portion of scriptures. As he studied with an earnest, with earnest prayer for divine enlightenment, that which before had appeared dark to his understanding was made clear. He experienced the truth of the psalmist's words, Thy entrance of thy words giveth light, it giveth understanding unto the simple. Psalms 119, 130. With intense interest, he studied the book of Daniel and the Revelation, employing the same principles of interpretation as in the other scriptures, and found to his great joy that the prophetic symbols could be understood. He saw that the prophecies, so far as they had been fulfilled, had been fulfilled literally, and that all the various figures Metaphors, parables, similitudes, etc. were either explained in their immediate connection or in the terms in which they were expressed were, de de were defined in other scriptures and, then, and when thus explained were to be literally understood. How were they to be understood? Literally, literally understood. Thus I was satisfied, he says, that the Bible was a system of revealed truth so clearly and simply given that the wayfaring man, though a fool, need not err therein. 
And then Ellen White says this, Link after link of the chain of truth rewarded his efforts as step by step he traced down the great lines of prophecy. Angels of heaven were guiding his mind and opening the scriptures to his understanding. So let's do a, we're going to do a workout now on how this works. So, <clears throat> okay, there you go. Okay, so we're going to do a little Pictionary. Okay, so can everybody see that? What does it say? I'm the little horn. So where do we find this guy at? Daniel chapter 7. Let's go there. Daniel chapter 7. Okay, Daniel chapter 7. And uh, what happens here is uh, you pick this story up. In um, where should I where should I begin it? Is because there's a, there's two different ways to explain this, but let's do it in verse twenty. Daniel chapter seven and verse twenty. And he had ten horns, and there was on his head, and the other which came up, and before them three fell, even that horn that had eyes and a mouth. Notice I didn't put nose in there. He had eyes and a mouth, and a mouth that spake very great things, whose look was more stout than his fellows. Okay? Now, here's the thing. Let me see how this one works. Any better? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, um, the question is, are we really to expect that this little horn is going to be walking around and saying all these bad and nasty things about God in this form. Because this is the way it's described, isn't it? Yep. Mm -hmm. But is this the case? No. No, because if you study this thing out, this right here is what? It's a figure. Okay? This is a figure. It's not literal. And according to Miller's rules, figures always have a figurative meaning. So, so this little horn with a mouth and all this kind of stuff can only ever, always, only, exclusively be understood as being figurative. Right? But according to what I just read there, once you identify who or what the figure is, how is it to be understood? Okay, so this guy right here, I'm going to do the triple crown here, is actually the Pope of Rome, right? Okay, he's the Pope. And this is the literal understanding. It is so simple, a child can understand this. The figurative is always figurative, but the meaning is always what? Literal. 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 That's it. Simple. Okay? Simple. So you would never take the figure and make it another figure, right? That would bring confusion. The figure has to be understood literally. And that's what Miller said. And, and Ellen White endorses it in that book. And she says, when he used this methodology right here, that angels of heaven were guiding his mind and opening the scripture to his understanding. And link after the link of the chain of truth was put in place using this methodology. Amen? Yes, amen. You're going to let scripture interpret itself. 
okay? Now, let's go to the controverted place where, that we're dealing with here and go to Daniel the 11th chapter. Okay? And we're going to do a we're going to do the, the first exercise is going to be very simple. Thank you. The first exercise is going to be very simple. And what we're going to do is we're going to go to Daniel 11 and verse 40. Because the argument is who this power is called the king of the north. Okay? Because in verse 45, the king of the north comes to his end, and then when that happens, probation closes. So we want to know what this is and who this is so that we can tell people when probation is about to close, right? So let's pick up the story in verse 40. Now, in verses 36 to 40, there's another power spoken of referred to as he, okay? In fact, let's, let's look at this in verse 39, so it flows better, okay? It says in verse 39, Thus he shall do in the most strongholds with a strange God, whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory, and he shall cause them to rule over many, and he shall divide the lane, land for gain. And at that time, the, excuse me, and at the time of the end, shall the king of the south push at him. Who's the king of the south pushing against? No. 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 The king of the south is pushing against whoever this is in verse 39. Let's do this again. There's a power being brought to bear in verse 39. Let's read this again. Thus he, it doesn't say that he's the king of the north, king of the south, west, or east. It just says he, right? Mm -hmm. Thus he shall do in the most strongholds with a strange God whom he, once again, referred to as he, shall acknowledge and increase with glory. And he shall cause them to rule over many and divide the land for gain. So there's this he, right? And then notice what it says. Very next verse, verse 40. And at the time of the end, the king of the south, south shall push at him. Who's him? Him is he. Him is the guy in verse 39. The king of the south is going to push against him. And then let's go on what happens next. And the king of the north shall come against him. Like a whirlwind with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships, and he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. So here's the story now. There's this power that's illustrated in verses 36 through 39. It's referred to as he or him. Okay? And, and then in verse 40, the king of the south shall push at him. And then the king of the north shall come against him. And what happens? What does the king of the north do? He comes against him with ships and chariots and overflows. In other words, the whole story of Daniel 11 is talking about one power overthrowing another power. And in verse 40, we have a clue because it says, at the time of the end. Now, Without going into a detailed Bible study right now, our, our Millerite uh, ancestors and all Seventh-day Adventists are agreed on this one point that 1798 is the time of the end. Okay? So this means that at the time of the end, you have to have a story, right, in which a power is going against the king of the south, and a power that the king of the north goes against, all in 1798. Okay? Now, first of all, let's do this. Let's do this. First of all, the language that's being employed, king of the north, 
Is it figurative, symbolic, or literal? It's literal? Okay, so let's, let's think about this for a minute. If you go in Daniel 7 and 8, the visions describing kings and kingdoms are described as horns, correct? So the figurative meaning for a king or a kingdom is a horn, okay? So it doesn't say here, horn of the north. It says king of the north, right? So in the literal application, if you go back to Daniel 7, when the angel tells, tells Daniel, these ten horns are ten kingdoms, right? The ten kingdoms or the ten kings, because you can't have a kingdom without a king, they're literal kingdoms. The kingdom or the king is the literal and that's why he's wearing this crown right here, because the Pope... Did, by the way, did you guys know that, that not only is the Pope a, the ruler of the Catholic Church, but he's also a king? Did you know that? Yes. They crown him the king. He's the king of Rome. Yeah. Okay? So he is he's a king. So the, figuratively, he's a horn, but literally, he's a king. Okay? So, so let's just, for argument's sake, let's just say that we're going to identify King of the North as literal. Even though we don't have permission to do it, let's just, for an exercise here, and we'll say K-O-N, standing for King of the North, and let's say that this is to be understood figuratively. Okay? So, how do we now find out uh, what the meaning of the King of the North is. If we're letting the Bible be its own expositor, how do we find out what the King of the North is? Line well, line. <laughs> line upon line. So what you're going to do is, and I'll save you the trouble here, if you do a study on different powers that come out of the North, you're going to come across two powers. And one of them is a Syrian Empire, and then that fell, and then the, it was replaced by the Babylonian Empire. Okay. And so what you have is, so what you have is this. If, if this king of the north is a figure, and the figure has to be understood how? Literally. Literally. So we have two choices. We can say that the king of the north is either Assyria or it's Babylon. I'm preferential to Babylon, so let's go ahead and write that down. In fact, though, if you go into the scripture... Uh, the first term as a nation applying to being in the north goes to Assyria before Babylon. But anyway, let's just go with Babylon. Okay, so, king of the north, and since once the figure is identified, it's to be literally understood. Okay? So, what we're saying is, as Seventh-day Adventists, is we're teaching that the papacy is Babylon. Oh, we have a problem. Okay. We have a major problem. Because remember, once the figure is identified, it's to be literally understood. So the only way that you could identify the king of the north as a figure is that if it was literally Babylon. But we have a major problem here. Because Babylon fell in 538 B.C. And the prophet Jeremiah says it would never rise again. It would never be another kingdom. And now, let's talk about Assyria. Well, that fell too. And that's no longer a kingdom. So you can't apply either one as being the literal. That's it. Do you understand what I'm saying? There's nothing more you can do. Because the rule says, once you, the figure is to always be figuratively understood, but once you identify what the figure is, it's to be literally explained. That's it. Now, how do people make it literal? literal? Well, they do a, how many people have ever played hopscotch? Yep. And, and this is what they do with scriptures. 
So they say the king of the north is figurative. And, uh, and that means that a king of the north refers to Babylon, but that's a figure too. And Babylon spiritually means the papacy. You see what's, now they've just broken the rules. Mm -hmm. Because you're doing this leapfrog thing, and you're saying, this is spiritual, this is spiritual, and then it's spiritual Babylon. D am I making sense? Mm -hmm. And that violates the rules laid down by Miller and endorsed by Spirit of Prophecy. So, it should be AD, shouldn't it? what? 538 AD? No, 538 BC. BC. The night that the handwriting was on the wall and Babylon oh, fell, yeah. it just so happens that there's a 538 BC and a 538 AD. Okay? So, uh, so, so friends, it, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, I will not criticize you. If you can make, using the rules that Ellen White and Miller endorse, if you can make the king of the north be the papacy using those rules, I would sure love to see it. Because I haven't been able to figure it out. There's just no way to make it happen. The only way to make it happen is triple spiritual application of prophecy. And there isn't one single teaching within the foundations of Adventism that's laid using those principles. No, not one. They don't exist. That's confusion. So how do we do this? Well, here's what we do. Because at the end of the world, we have the gift of prophecy. So let's go to step two and uh, let's listen to what the prophet said. And this is coming from manuscript M one MR one MR starting on page sixty, paragraph five. It says this. This is what the prophet says. Especially what does that mean? Especially. In particularly, especially, should the book Daniel and the Revelation be brought before the people as the very book for this time? <gasps> what? That's powerful, friends. This is the prophet now. Let me read this again. Especially should the book Daniel and the Revelation be brought before the people as the very book for this time. This book contains the message which all need to read and understand. Translated into many different languages, it will be a power to enlighten the world. This book has had a large sale in Australia and New Zealand. By reading it, many souls have come to the knowledge of the truth. I have received many letters expressing appreciation of this book. Let our canvassers urge this book upon the attention of all. The Lord has shown me. Who? The Lord. The Lord, the Lord has shown me that this book will do a good work in enlightening those who become interested in the truth for this time. Those who embrace the truth now, who have not shared in the experiences of those who entered the work in the early history of the message, should study the instruction given in Daniel and the Revelation, becoming f familiar with the truth it presents. You know why she's saying this? Because, friends, the author of this book went through the 1844 experience. Mm -hmm. He was there. She goes on. Those who are preparing to enter the ministry, who desire to become successful students of the prophecies. How many people here want to be a successful student of the prophecies? Amen. 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 This is what the prophet says. If you want to be successful in the prophecies, 
What do you need? I lost my place here. Oh, who desire to become successful students of the prophecies will find Daniel in the Revelation an invaluable help. They need to understand this book. I think I'll pick it up right now at this time. They need to understand this book. It speaks of the past, present, and future, laying out the path so plainly that none need err therein. Those who will diligently study this book will have no relish for cheap sediments presented by those who have a burning desire to get out something new and strange to the, present to the flock of God. The rebuke of God is upon all such teachers. Did you hear that? Friends, that's super serious. If you are rejecting the truths that are brought out in this book and you're presenting something new, according to Ellen White, the rebuke of God is upon you. They need that one teach them what is meant by godliness and truth. Listen to this, friends. What is the main topic in this book that brings us the close of probation? The Eastern question. And if you hearken back to this morning, when, when, when the two men, when the two brothers, uh, Brother Caro and Brother Smith, went to speak before the people, Ellen White says the Brother Caro spoke first on the Sabbath question. Amen? The Sabbath question. And Brother Smith spoke on the Eastern question. Notice she says this. This is what she says. It speaks, this book, speaks of the past, present, and future, laying out the path so plainly that none need err therein. Those who will diligently study this book will have no relish for the cheap sediments represented by those with a burning desire to get up something new and strange to present to the flock of God. The rebuke of God is upon all such teachers. They need that one teach them what is meant by godliness and truth. The great essential questions which God would have presented to the people are found in Daniel and the Revelation. There is found solid, eternal truth for this time. Everyone needs the light and information it contains. If ever there was a book that had an endorsement by the prophet, to this degree, I don't know it. This is the book. In other places, she says that this book is God's helping hand. So, this book's endorsed by the prophet. So, why don't we find out how this book tells us that we're to understand that we are to understand how to decipher what is north king of the north king of the south and this way it'll be very easy for us to understand okay so we're going to go to the very beginning of chapter 11 11 and notice what this says right here in the book right here it says this is the 1897 version of daniel and the revelation it says a literal prophecy. Do you see this? Do you see this? Okay. So let me explain why we're to understand this thing literally. And, and we're going to allow the Bible to explain this. This is very important. Turn with me back to Daniel. Uh, we'll get to that at the end, yes. Turn with me to Daniel, and uh, we're going to go to Daniel chapter 7 again. We've been there a lot today, but we're going to go there again. Okay? And, and let's just review this for a little bit. Remember Nebuchadnezzar had this dream, and it really bothered him and everything? Yeah. Okay. And then Daniel has a dream, and it really bothers him. Daniel has this dream, and he sees all these beasts coming up, out of the earth, I mean, excuse me, they're, they're coming up out of the sea, right? They're, so all these beasts are coming up, and uh, one right after another, and uh, they're crazy looking, 
And the last one really bothers them because it has, you know, these ten horns and everything. And then this little horn comes up. And so after the vision, this is what he says in verse 15. Daniel 7, verse 15. It says, I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit in the midst of my body, and the visions of my head, they troubled me. Okay? So he's really troubled because he realizes that there's a symbolic meaning here. He wants to understand what that symbolic meaning is. So what does he do? I came near unto one of them that stood by and asked him the truth of all this. Right? What is he asking? The truth. So he told me and made me know the interpretation of the things. And what does he say? These great beasts which are four are four what? Kings which shall arise out of the earth. So a beast represents a what? King. A king. king. Right? Pretty simple. So Daniel says, okay, I saw this dream. I saw these beasts. I want to know the truth. And the angel comes to him and he says, okay, here's the interpretation. So truth equals what? Interpretation. Interpretation. Amen? Okay. So symbolically or figuratively, you have beasts and horns that represent kings and kingdoms. Amen? Now, let's go to Daniel 11, because that's where all the controversy is these days. And it shouldn't be, friends, because it's plain. It's very plain here. First of all, you should know this. Daniel chapter 11 is a commentary on the beasts of Daniel chapter 8. Okay? And let's read whether or not this is written in figurative language or literal language as this book here that's endorsed by Ellen White. Now let's go to Daniel 11 and verse 2. Notice what it says here. And now will I show thee the what? Truth. Truth. Did you see that? Is he saying, I'm going to show you this figurative uh, story of beasts and all these kind of things? Now I'm coming to show you what? The truth, the interpretation. And notice what he says. Behold, there shall stand up three kings where? In Persia. He's not saying there's going to be three horns that are going to pop up on the head of that ram that has two horns, one higher than the other. Because that's the figurative figure for Persia. But now he's saying there's going to be what? Literal. Three literal kings. And the fourth king shall be far richer than they all. And by his strength and through his riches, he shall stir up all against the realm of who? Grecia or Greece. And he's not calling Greece a what? He's not calling it a ram. A he, I mean, excuse me, a he goat with a horn, Right? He's saying it's a king of Greece. This is literal language, friends. This is, not, this is not figurative. This is literal. And notice this in verse 3. And a mighty king, it doesn't say a great horn. It says a mighty king shall stand up and shall rule with great dominion and do according to his will. And when he shall stand up, the kingdom shall be what? Broken and divided toward the four winds of heaven. This is literal language. Do you want to see it in symbolic language? Let's go to Daniel chapter 8. Talking about this power. Here it is. Daniel chapter 8 and verse 7. And I saw him clo come close under the ram, and he was moved with collar against him, and smote the ram, and brake his two horns. And there was no power in the ram, to stand before him, and he cast him to the ground, and stamped upon him, and he, excuse me, and there was none that could deliver the ram out of his hand. Therefore the he goat waxed very great, and when he was strong, the great horn was broken, and for it came four notable horns toward the four winds. That's figurative, friends. Daniel 11, that's literal. Do you understand? Do you see the difference? It's night and day. Night and day. One is talking about a ram and a he-goat and horns, 
And the other one is talking about the kings of Persia and the king of Greece. And when the king of Greece is raised up great, he's going to be broken and his kingdom is going to be divided toward the four winds. And this says right here, notice what it says. It says, and therefore the he wrote in verse 8, waxed very great, and when, his, and when he was strong, the great horn was broken, and for it came up four notable ones towards the four winds of heaven, and out of one of them, out of one of the what? Horns. horns. And what is a horn? Kingdom. A kingdom. So four kingdoms are going to arise out of Alexander's kingdom. And then notice this. And then there, and out of one of them came forth a little horn. Did the little horn come up among them like it did in Daniel 7? No, it came out of one of the horns. This is figurative, friends. So how do we explain this? Well, let me read what the book says. The book that's endorsed by Ellen White. But friends, even if it wasn't endorsed by Ellen White, it's the only thing that makes sense. It says, a, Daniel 11, a literal prophecy. And I'm not going to read the whole thing. I just want to get to this point right here. And we're going to look at page... Uh, in this particular book right here, it's 191. In some versions... It's between 222 and 224, okay? In the smaller ones, yes. And it says here, and I quote, The king of the north and the king of the south are many times referred to in the remaining portions of this chapter. It is therefore becomes essential, and remember what Ellen White said, all the essential truths for this time are in this book. Amen? It becomes essential in understanding of the prophecy to clearly identify these powers. When Alexander's empire was divided, the different portions lay toward the four winds of heaven. West, north, east, and south. These divisions, of course to be reckoned from the standpoint of Palestine, the native land of the prophet. That division of the empire lying west of Palestine would thus constitute the kingdom of the west. That lying north, the kingdom of the north. That lying east, the kingdom of the east. And that lying to the south, the kingdom of the south. The divisions of Alexander's kingdom that was lying south Oh, excuse me. The, king, the divisions of Alexander's kingdom with respect to Palestine were situated as follows. Cassander, because remember, who were these four kings? They were his generals. There was like eight generals, but, you know, they beat each other up, and finally there was four, okay? So let's read on. They were divided up this way. Cassander had Greece and the adjacent countries which lie to the west. So who had that? Cassander. Lysimachus had Thrace, which then included Asia Minor and the countries on the Hellespot and Bosporus, which lie to the north of Palestine. So Lucas had Syria and Babylon, which lay principally to the east. And Ptolemy had Egypt and neighboring countries, which lie in the south. During the wars and revolutions, which for long ages succeeded, these geographical boundaries were frequently changed or obliterated. Old ones were wiped out and new ones instituted. But whenever changes might occur, these first divisions of the empire must determine the names which these portions of territory should ever afterwards bear or we have no standard by which to test the application of prophecy. That is, whatever power at any time should occupy the territory which at first constituted the kingdom of the north, 
that power, so long as it occupied that territory, would be the king of the north. And whatever power occupied that which at first constituted the king of the south, that power would so long as it be king of the south. We speak of only these two because they are the only ones afterwards spoken of in the prophecy and because, in fact, almost the whole of Alexander's empire finally resolved itself into two divisions. Cassander was very soon conquered by Lysimachus and his kingdom, Greece, and Macedon was annexed to Thrace. And Lysimachus was in turn conquered by Seleucus. And Macedonia and Thrace were annexed to Syria. These facts prepare the way for an application of texts before us. The king of the south, Egypt, shall be strong. Ptolemy annexed Cyrus, excuse me, Cyprus, Phoenicia, and Cara, Cyrene, and many islands and cities in Egypt. Thus, with his kingdom made strong, both of Alexander's princes is introduced in the expression, one of his princes. So what we have here is a situation, friends, where we have the Bible is determining who the king of the south is. God is not the author of confusion because, friends, listen, I want you to think very hard about this. God would never call a king a king of the south and have him be in the north. Does that make sense? North is south, south is north, all this kind of stuff. We're going to get into trouble right there. We have to take the Bible just as it reads that the divisions of these kingdoms, this is not the way it goes. These are literal kings, literal kingdoms, okay? And how it's it's divided up. Under the board. Ah, thank you. You don't have to tell me more than five or six times. Okay, so let's make it really easy. You have a big horn, and the big horn is broken, and four horns come up, and each one goes to the four winds, north, south, east, and west. Is that simple or what? And now all we have to do is identify who's controlling the geographic area known as North, and they become known as the King of the North. (sighs) Is that simple? Is that a message that can go to the world? Friends, that's the message that this morning we showed where every seat in the house was taken and thousands were standing and they were multiple feet deep and... It was an unbelievable. People's jaws are hanging open. It's just what they wanted to hear. And friends, it's just what they want to hear today. And it was simple enough. It, it was very simple. This is so simple, friends. And what happens is, eventually, the north and the south, I mean, the east and the west are annexed into these two powers right here. And in the end, there's just the king of the north and the king of the south left in this region. Ah, oh, but we forget... There's this little horn that came out of the western one, out of one of the little ones, and it gets mingled up in here too. But he's from a different geographic area. Because Daniel chapter 7 tells us that the little horn comes up where? Among the ten. Amen? In the story of Daniel 7, the little horn comes up out of the ten, among the ten. But in this story right here, he doesn't come up among the four. He comes up out of one of them. And that's a study for another day. But friends, listen. The king of the north is the power that controls that region between the two areas that are left over. And what's that area called today? Turkey. Turkey. It's Turkey, friends. And a couple years ago, because I had heard this first like 26 years ago, and I sort of blew it off as not being valid. And, but I remember reading enough of it. I remember reading enough of it, and I remembered that our pioneers taught that Turkey was the king of the north. And then a few years ago, I don't know, two and a half, three years ago, I was watching a news program, 
and uh, the president of Turkey came on and he gave a speech and he said, I'm going to go to Jerusalem and we're going to set up our authority there. And, and he starts using all this language, just like Daniel 11, verse 45. And the hair on the back of my neck, literally, I mean, it like stood up. I was like, whoa, I've heard this before. And where did I hear it before? In that book. Because that's what our pioneers taught, that this power right here would go to Jerusalem and try and establish itself there. And in the process of that happening, it would come to its end and nobody would help him. And then what would happen? Michael stands up and this event would cause a time of trouble such as the world has never seen. And I can promise you this, friends, when the Mohammedan power tries to establish itself at Jerusalem, it's going to cause a time of trouble such as the world's never seen. And by the way, he comes to his end when? At or before Michael stands up. And friends, the papacy doesn't come to his end at the close of probation. No. The papacy comes to his end at the brightness of Christ's coming. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, it is so clear. It's so easy. It's so exciting that we have a message to share with the world. We can share with them the events leading the close of probation. Like uh, one of our fi uh, pioneers said, um, Elder Haskell, he said, As the world watches Turkey, let us pay attention to what's going on in the most holy place. And so, Lord, as things are wrapping up, we can use this to our benefit. We can teach them about the Eastern question, what's going on in the Middle East, how it's going to end over there, and we can pique people's interest. And once we uh, bring them in and share with them the events that are happening in the Middle East and what, with Jerusalem, and we, they have our attention, then, and then we can share with them the wonderful truths of the Sabbath and the mark of the beast and who this little horn is, who the papacy is, and who this power is in Revelation chapter 13 that gives his power and authority over to the first beast and causes all the world to worship the first beast and receive a mark on their right hand or on their forehead that they may not buy or sell unless they have the mark. Lord, we have a powerful message. And the people that will listen to this, they will hear because they see it on the news and they know that something great and momentous is about to take place. And we have the answers, Lord, to show them these events that are leading to the close of all human probation. Let us be wise unto salvation and let us teach the message as was given by our forefathers. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.